Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Tuesday, November 22nd, 2016. This is my final podcast from the Secret Studio, which I've occupied for 15 years, or just one month shy of 15 years. After I post this podcast, we're going to pull the plug, unwire this room, and move across town to a new location that has better facilities for me and lower rent. And my back is aching already, and I haven't even lifted the big boxes yet. So uh, we expect to be able to complete all this and resume our regular podcast activity on Monday, November 28th. Today is also the 53rd anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And for those of us who witnessed that grisly event and the way it changed our nation, it's really unforgettable. Everybody I know who was uh, present and alive that day can remember where they were and how they heard the news. And for me, it was further horrifying because a day or two later, I was watching the black-and-white TV that we had with my brothers, and I was a witness to the murder of the alleged assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, by strip club owner and mafia-connected guy, uh, Jack Ruby. And I just screened a new film that uh, is in circulation now called A Coup in Camelot. It was well-produced and very interesting, and it establishes pretty clearly that the single-shooter theory, the magic bullet theory, could not be true. But I was disappointed the film doesn't go further in advancing any uh, theories about who did it and how it was achieved. And as we get ready to regale you with the latest bizarre antics of President-elect Donald Trump, I'm hearing people, friends, loved ones, and I saw a couple of Facebook posts by people who I think are pretty, uh, pretty silly to do so. But there are people advocating the assassination of Donald Trump. And I have great fears about what he will do to our nation if he is actually permitted to be sworn in on January 20th. But I do not advocate any kind of violence. I have liberal friends who have decided to rally. They want to push for the electors in the Electoral College to name Hillary Clinton instead of Donald Trump. It's possible, but very far-fetched. And one of those friends said, well, you know, it could produce a violent revolution, and I don't care. He said, I did bang, bang for my country, referring to his service in the military in the Korean War. And he's ready to do bang, bang again, he said. Well, I do not advocate that. Now to the Trump news. Well, after trashing media and hammering some of the top TV anchors yesterday, Donald Trump sallied forth from Trump Tower to the Gray Lady, the offices of the New York Times. And he met briefly in an off-the-record session and then went on the record, and Times reporters live tweeted, <laughs> which is, is a new tactic for them, uh, their interview it was a group grope with the Donald. One of the things that he told the Times is that he does not plan to prosecute Hillary Clinton. Now, he's essentially saying, never mind, or maybe it's like Obama. He's looking forward, not backward. And Kellyanne Conway, the very talented, uh, and I, I fear her talents, she's a very talented spin mistress, well, she went on MSDNC yesterday and said that uh, the president-elect wants to move beyond the issues of the campaign and suggested that Hillary Clinton needs healing and that uh, by being given a pass on any further investigation or prosecution, if Donald Trump can help her heal, then perhaps that's a good thing. Well, I think Donald Trump wants to see people heal but he spells it H-E-E-L. And as a dog lover, you know what I mean by that. That's how you train a dog to walk on command. <laughs> Heel. <laughs> uh, 
That's the kind of healing he's more interested in. And when he called the meeting of these TV anchors who trooped to the tower and were there for the, uh, you know, perp walk to the elevator, <laughs> Lester Holt and Charlie Rose and Wolf Blitzer and uh, who else was there? I guess Chuck Todd. Anyway, oh, George Stephanopoulos. So they went in, and uh, Glenn Greenwald sneers at all this. You can find his commentary at The Intercept. And uh, it is pretty funny that after being thrashed by Donald Trump throughout the primary, used and abused, they gave him way too much airtime at the expense of the nation and the other candidates, and they agreed to an off-the-record meeting where the Donald just didn't just go off the record, he went off. <laughs> and he accused them, uh, well, we, we only have indirect comments because, as Greenwald points out, uh, the reporters generally held to their off-the-record agreement but then promptly leaked without attribution to David Remnick at The New Yorker and a few other people. So uh, this was... <laughs> really uh, a disaster, as Trump would uh, uh, choose uh, a word. Uh, This is a disaster that the media invited. And speaking of the excess coverage that he got, one of thin-skinned Donald's complaints is that uh, Alec Baldwin's uh, portrayal of him, his satiric portrayal on Saturday Night Live, is uh, unfair, and that uh, Donald was asking whether he deserves equal time. And I find that extremely, extremely rich because Trump abused the equal time provisions that the cable networks are not bound by, but the broadcast networks are. And nobody enforces this, but it's part of the Communications Act of 1934, and the networks and their own stations could be fined or otherwise penalized for not honoring the equal time provisions. But nobody's talking about uh, imposing them or even looking at how unfair the distribution of airtime was during the primaries and the general election campaign. And now Donald, the guy who's benefited from billions of dollars of free media time, because he is so thin-skinned and sensitive, he needs people to like him. And in the live tweet from the Times, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll link to their uh, collection of tweets, and you can, uh, you know, scroll through them yourselves. But one of the things that surfaces, somebody asks him if, you know, he's going to open up the libel laws, and he admits that, well, if he did that, he might get sued more often, so maybe that's not a good idea. And then they said, well, what about the First Amendment? And he said, you're going to like it. And a lot of his thinking revolves around his uh, desperate need to be liked. And he assumes we're all like that. It is bizarre. So, uh, first of all, Trump canceled the meeting with the New York Times in an early morning tweet. And then he reinstated the meeting and showed up there at uh, noontime. And he claimed in uh, one of the early morning tweets, I canceled today's meeting with the failing New York Times when the terms and conditions of the meeting were changed at the last moment. Not nice. Well, the Times denies that they changed the, uh, the ground rules. And in fact, it was Reince Priebus, the incoming White House chief of staff, who told the president that the Times had tried to change the conditions apparently trying to lead him into canceling the meeting. And apparently Priebus was concerned that the president was unprepared for the topics that might come up. So (laughs) this is the kind of on-again, off-again, hot and cold, do you like me enough for me to show up? This is the persona that is the president-elect. And while I mention the idea of the Electoral College... I got a note from Jerry Fresia. He's a longtime listener and subscriber. He said, I haven't heard anyone talking of pressuring the electors, so I offer this. Given that Clinton won the popular vote and half the population, in addition to the establishment of both major parties, believe that what is happening is not normal and threatens our way of life, and given that the electors meet on December 19, and given that there is precedent from 1836 for faithless electors to abstain or vote contrary to how the population of their state voted, technically at least, we still have a chance to prevent Trump from ever reaching the White House. 
how to pressure electors ought to be up for discussion. Ralph Nader has been talking about getting a 1,000 people in each congressional district to begin making demands across the board. Well, I'm in favor of any organized effort to reflect the popular vote. And also, we still need to see the final results in Michigan, in Wisconsin, and in North Carolina. Because as of this moment, as I'm speaking in my last podcast before Thanksgiving, Donald Trump has not secured an actual victory. It has been conceded to him by the Clinton camp. But that is not the same. And as you know, I had Greg Palast on a couple of days after the election. That podcast is still available and should be unrestricted now if you're not a subscriber. And he flatly says that the Republican voter suppression schemes worked. And they did rig the election for Trump. But the Democrats are just so <laughs> unwilling to fight. They lack the spine that I think is needed. So uh, we've been talking about Trump. He hammers the TV anchors. He goes and plays games with the New York Times. And yesterday afternoon, he released a two-and-a-half-minute promotional video on YouTube. So he doesn't need the media. All he has to do is tweet to his 28 million followers, or I guess it's 17 million on Twitter and another 11 million on other social media. All he has to do is push it out to them, and he doesn't need Lester Holt or, or Wolf Blitzer or George Stephanopoulos. And this is a change. This is something different. Now, Obama has released certain targeted videos like this, but not really as a substitute to press conferences and other interactions. Now, Obama hasn't been perfect by any means. He has kept the press at arm's length, and there are so many subjects that he has never been asked about, it, it drives me crazy. And so this promotional video was a description of what he's planning to do in his first hundred days. And it's most interesting for what he left out. He steered clear of his most inflammatory campaign promises to deport immigrants, track Muslims, and his pledge to repeal the Affordable Care Act. There was no mention of his plan to build a wall along the border with Mexico, uh, no mention of uh, ending the Obama program, I think it's called DACA, uh, delayed action uh, on young immigrants. And uh, so <laughs> it, it was bizarre in many respects. Now, one of the things he did say was that he is going to roll back regulations, cancel job-killing restrictions on the production of American energy, including shale energy and clean coal, creating many millions of high-paying jobs. What bullshit. He also said that he is going to require that for any new regulation that's put on the books, we have to repeal two of them. And that suggests that there are thousands, if not millions, of meaningless regulations, things that come from the horse and buggy era, or when we used to have the cavalry, when we used to have ice boxes instead of refrigerators. <laughs> and it's just not the case. And the idea that there are so many regulations that are outdated or ineffective or... Uh, just ripe for repeal, that's pretty bizarre. And it's not based on any factual notion that I've seen from anywhere. Now, Democrats are gasping because one of the people who made the trek to Trump Tower yesterday is a Democratic congresswoman from Hawaii named Tulsi Gabbard. And in many respects, I'm very impressed with Tulsi Gabbard. She is a combat veteran from Iraq who publicly opposes regime change based U.S. military action. And she was one of the leading Democrats to embrace and endorse Bernie Sanders, and he picked up on her message against regime change. I think she made a big impact on Sanders. I wish it had happened earlier in the primary campaign cycle. So I know a lot of people, I've seen it on Facebook. One guy even called Tulsi Gabbard a political slut. And I'm offended by that. Because I think Donald Trump ne needs to hear from Tulsi Gabbard. I don't know that he's going to give her any position in the administration. But her points of view, which appear to match some of the unfocused comments that Donald Trump has made about regime change, 
Well, if if she can bolster him to reject the neocons and the neoliberal interventionists, well, that could be a good thing. And I'm linking to Robert Perry's commentary on what he calls the Tulsi Gabbard factor. And I generally agree with Bob Perry here that, uh, you know, there is no, no rule that she is violating by meeting with Trump and that it's valuable to support him in his uh, anti-neocon posture. And despite some of the people who he is talking to who might be a part of his administration, he does appear to separate himself from the Bush area, uh, Bush era neocons, and uh, explicitly the Samantha Power, Susan Rice, Hillary Clinton approach to foreign policy of the last eight years. And so I think this is a very interesting development. And uh, the other thing that's interesting in the Bob Perry piece is that he quotes uh, General Michael Flynn, who has been tapped as uh, Trump's incoming national security advisor. And uh, Flynn has objected to the notion that drone strikes are a route to success. Quote, we've tended to say, drop another bomb via a drone and put out a headline that we killed Abu Bag of Donuts. And it makes us all feel good for 24 hours, Flynn said. And you know what? It doesn't matter. It just made them a martyr. It just created a new reason to fight us even harder. Well, if Flynn understands that, then I can overlook some of his inflammatory comments about Islam and Muslims and similar, similar issues. There is a report today in the New York Times that the Islamic State has used chemical weapons at least 52 times on the battlefield in Syria and Iraq in the last two years. Now, I consider this somewhat speculative. It comes from a source called IHS Conflict Monitor, a London-based intelligence collection and analysis service. And as it relates to Syria, we've seen a lot of uh, inexpert expertise rolled out in the corporate media. But let's take this at face value. That crude chemical weapons have been used by the Islamic State. And I don't deny that. I don't know that it's 52 times. They're saying that 19 of these attacks have taken place in and around Mosul in uh, recent weeks. But buried in this article is an honest statement that is, like I say, buried and downplayed. It simply says the Islamic State is not the only actor in Syria to carry out chemical weapon strikes. The Syrian government has conducted many more such attacks, more than 52. Now, we know that a deal that was brokered by Putin uh, allegedly caused Syria to disgorge its chemical weapons capacity. But they've been using crude uh, chlorine, uh, liquid chlorine that's just put in buckets and dropped on people. And that is a chemical weapon. It's, it's crude. But it is. And that lack of balance is something that I think is important to note. The New York Times is presenting a biased account in that article that I just referred to. Meanwhile, there is more loud silence from the Washington Beltway as the authoritarian government of uh, Recep Erdogan in Turkey has cracked down even further. Yesterday, they fired an additional 15,000 public employees and shut down 375 organizations, including nine more news outlets. More than 100,000 public workers have been fired because they claim that they were all connected to the failed coup from July 15th of this year, or that they're connected to Kurdish terrorist groups. Now, this is fiction. There's no evidence that's offered to support the sacking of these public employees or the demonization of them for alleged ties to Kurdish groups. Now, here's the more alarming development. Erdogan's Justice and Development Party is pushing legislation to declare an amnesty for an estimated 4,000 men convicted of child abuse and rape, provided that they have married their victims. Now, this appears to be some tilt toward Islam, 
acknowledging that a husband somehow has the right to sexually abuse his child or to rape his wife. And at the same time, Erdogan is pushing the European Union to grant membership to Turkey. And again, silence from official Washington. Every day I pause for a second to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. And I have failed to mention that Clifford Johnson in Minneapolis signed up for a new annual subscription recently. Clifford, thank you very much. I have confirmed that you're online and active, and I'm glad to see it. I also want to thank people like uh, Benny Alto, Faith Peoples, Christopher Cowgill just took out a new annual subscription, and I appreciate each and every one of you. So uh, if you haven't taken out a subscription, let me invite you to come over to PeterBCollins.com. You click on the menu button, then it come, pulls down. You click on Become a Subscriber. That takes you to the sign-up page. That's where our bonus books are displayed, and new annual subscribers in the continental U.S. qualify for that bonus book. And as I mentioned, I'm moving the secret studio here. If you would like to make a one-time contribution to help offset the cost, it's about a thousand bucks to move all the phone lines and rent a truck and uh, that sort of thing. I would be very, very grateful. Yesterday, I reported to you on the mainstream media silence over the uh, excessive force used on Standing Rock protesters in North Dakota. And Sunday night, the media failed to cover, but the uh, really uh, plucky individuals of Unicorn Riot and uh, the guy named Kevin Gilbert, who was live streaming, provided us with uh, the coverage that shows that the cops there are lying. They said, oh, we didn't use any water cannons on the protesters. We just used that to put out fires. And that is flatly false. We now know that a 21-year-old New York woman who was there standing firm with the Standing Rock Sioux was severely injured by explosives during that Sunday night, Monday morning uh, showdown. A concussion grenade fired by the police exploded, and Sophia Wolanski may face amputation of one of her arms because of this explosive device. Now, the sheriff's department keeps trying to wiggle out of responsibility for the water cannon first. Now they're saying that uh, protesters who had rigged a propane bottle uh, might be to blame. Well, that doesn't square with the uh, testimony of the injured woman and the people who were there. So, Wolanski wrote on her Facebook page just before she was airlifted to Minneapolis, Friends, please know that I was severely, devastatingly injured by the pipeline pigs last night. And what we are learning is that she underwent eight hours of emergency surgery to save her arm, Wolanski's father told reporters his daughter had been hit by a concussion, a concussion grenade fired by a police officer, which had damaged the arteries, medial nerve, muscle, and bone in her left arm, and that the best-case scenario is 10 to 20 percent functionality with no pain. That's the best case, and there is still the possibility that uh, her arm may be amputated. The comforting thing that is uh, within hours, within 12 hours, a fundraising campaign online raised $140,000 to help with her medical expenses. And as we look at the environmental issues, there is a battle raging between the descendants of the Rockefeller family. John D. Rockefeller was the founder of Standard Oil, which is now called ExxonMobil. And the descendants of Rockefeller are fighting with the descendants of Standard Oil. The Rockefellers have been using their money to fund uh, research and reporting that has called ExxonMobil, uh, called foul on them for its climate policies. And ExxonMobil is fighting back against the Rockefellers. <laughs> uh, who are you going to root for here? And one of the interesting things is that Exxon says that it has recognized the threat of climate change. It has stopped funding the denials, the uh, deniers. And it is, it is true that in 2006, ExxonMobil stopped its major six-figure annual funding to the Competitive Enterprise Institute. But at the same time, uh, critics have shown that Exxon uh, used its knowledge of climate change 
to try to uh, position itself to drill more oil. <laughs> and uh, that's pretty embarrassing as it has been exposed. I've linked to an article by Joshua Emer Emerson Smith. Joshua was a producer here at the Peter B. Collins Show about eight years ago. And he's a bright young man who is now a staff reporter for the San Diego Union Tribune. The article I'm linking to is a survey of climate deniers and climate change activists about the potential of a Trump presidency. And it's a pretty balanced article. You do hear from both sides. That does promote the false equivalency that the critics of climate change reaction, the deniers, uh, <laughs> are due the same credibility as the scientists and activists who believe that humans have caused climate change. And this morning, I, I heard Rush Limbaugh for a moment, and he just said flatly, there's no way that humans have caused the climate change that we're talking about. And one of the people who supports the Limbaugh denial perspective is Myron Abel. This is a guy I've interviewed three or four times. He's at the Competitive Enterprise Institute that used to get money from ExxonMobil. He is being considered by Trump for the post of uh, director of the Environmental Protection Agency. Yes, putting a member of the wrecking crew in place. And in uh, Joshua Emerson Smith's article, he uh, quotes some interesting people who are sharply critical of Myron Abel, including, uh, what is Severinghouse's first name here? He, he's uh, Professor Jeff Severinghouse at UC San Diego. And uh, he takes down Myron Abel to an extent. But Myron Abel needs to be exposed because he's not even a real scientist. And he writes papers and gives media interviews where he repeats the same talking points over and over again and acts if, as if that makes them true. <laughs> also, we're learning that if Trump follows through on a promise to pull out of the Paris climate change accords, he could be sparking an international trade war over carbon tariffs, including countries like Mexico and Canada that might attempt to... Uh, put a carbon tariff on, not just to pay for a wall, <laughs> but to extract from the United States compensation for the uh, impact on our neighboring countries from the greenhouse gases that we continue to, em to emit. So uh, I don't know what the prospects are for this actually occurring, but I hope it does give pause to uh, the Donald before he pulls us out of the Paris Climate Change Accord. And finally today, two takes on fake news, the scourge that has uh, become, uh, you know, better known in the last couple of weeks since the election. And I'm going to both credit and shame the New York Times. I will credit them with doing a very interesting deconstruction of a case from just after the election where a guy in Austin, Texas, took pictures of a bunch of buses. These are passenger buses, tourist-type buses, uh, the kind that you can charter. They were parked near the Capitol in Austin. And this guy, whose name is uh, Tucker, what is it? Uh, uh, Eric Tucker. He's a 35-year-old guy in Austin, Texas. He took pictures of the buses. He uh, then tweeted out, Anti-Trump protesters in Austin today are not as organic as they seem. Here are the buses they came in. Well, unfortunately, that wasn't true. But it didn't stop 13,000 people from retweeting it, and then 16,000 people uh, retweeted that. And then, what do you know, Donald Trump is tweeting that professional protesters are going to the streets and how shameful that is. Well, uh, this wasn't true. And the bus company has established that they had parked their buses there, but they didn't bring any protesters on the buses, organized or otherwise. But then the New York Times ran an editorial. And I cite once again Robert Perry at Consortium News. I've linked to his commentary. In its lead editorial this past Sunday, the Times decried what it deemed the digital virus called fake news and called for Internet censorship to counter this alleged problem. And Perry cites some of the fake news items that we've heard about. One that the Pope had endorsed Donald Trump. 
the other that uh, Trump was uh, leading in the popular vote over Hillary Clinton. And Perry cites his own hoax that liberal documentarian Michael Moore had endorsed Trump when he actually was backing Clinton. And uh, Perry also notes that Clinton supporters were privately uh, pushing some salacious and unsubstantiated charges about Trump's sex life. Clinton personally charged that Trump was under the control of Russian President Vladimir Putin, although there was no evidence presented to support this McCarthyistic accusation. I'm also inserting here that David Brock's uh, dark money super PAC, which is called Correct the Record, was actually busy faking the record. And he had Internet trolls that were patrolling to keep people in line who put up critical comments about Hillary Clinton. And also he had a a little plantation of media shops, including Blue Nation Review, that put out lots of propaganda, pro-Clinton propaganda, during the campaign. So uh, Bob Perry then turns the tables on the New York Times, which is calling for official censorship. And he notes the deep, embarrassing efforts Back in 2002, uh, the Judy Miller report about the mobile weapons labs in, in Iraq. And he cites another, uh, a bunch of other examples of uh, failings by the New York Times. He doesn't include 9-11, which I would add to the list. But Bob Perry is one of those people who uh, is not willing to consider that uh, 9-11 and the official narrative, well, he's, he's not willing to challenge that. Uh, Despite that, he says that uh, what the Times is suggesting here is a form of official censorship and that there is now a group called the First Draft Coalition, which is financed by Google, and the Times and other mainstream news outlets sit on the board uh, of this First Draft Coalition, which Perry describes as a kind of ministry of truth that will decide which stories are true and which are fake. Now, I don't in any way support passing off false information as fact. But I think people are are wise and canny enough to look at Facebook, to look at Twitter, and decide, well, that's a credible story from a credible source, and this is an incredible story from a source that doesn't deserve any credibility. And I would prefer to have people wade through and figure it out for themselves than have some official manager of the truth. Because once we get there, the truth will be (laughs) highly elusive. Thanks for joining me for my last news and comment podcast from the old secret studio. I hope to resume on Monday, November 28th. I'm Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails to you Keep smiling